You ever think about the word thirst? Just saying the word sometimes can make you want to reach for a glass of water. It just kind of feels dry in your mouth, thirst. Of course, we all know that we need water every day to survive. At least eight glasses, they tell us. But you know, it doesn't matter how much water we drink today. I can drink all the water I want today. I'm still going to be thirsty again tomorrow. It's kind of the way it works. Doctors and experts tell us that a person can survive for about three days without water, maybe sometimes longer or shorter, depending on the situation. And it's been said that someone dying of thirst is suffering unimaginable agony. It's slow, it's painful, and it's quite frightening. There is this remarkable story about a man who managed to survive for six days in the Arizona desert without any water. It was in August of 1905, yeah, quite a while ago, but August of 1905 in the scorching heat of summer, Pablo Valencia set out one day with his partner to look for treasures there in southwestern Arizona. He had a thirst for treasure. But while they were on their way, they realized that they were quickly running out of water. They didn't bring enough along with them. So Pablo sent his partner off to find some, which he did. He found some water. But as he returned to where he had left his friend, he was nowhere to be found. A search party was formed, and they looked around for a few days. And after about three days, they kind of gave up, figuring that Pablo was lost. There's no way that he could possibly have survived this long without water. And so they gave him up for for dead. However, Pablo was still alive and he stumbled around there in the desert alone without a drop to drink for 6 days. And on that 6th day he stumbled into the camp of J.W. McGee. He was more dead than alive. McGee said that Pablo's skin was as dry and dark as beef jerky. Can you imagine that? His mouth and his eyelids were dry and cracked, his tongue severely swollen. He had almost no pulse and struggled just to take a breath. He was near death. But McGee, being the kind of guy that he was, carefully nursed him back to health. And within a week... Pablo had mostly recovered. It was an amazing ordeal that he went through to suffer six days without water. He was very grateful just to be alive because he knew how much danger he was in. And it's difficult for us to imagine the kind of agony that he was going through. Sure, we've all experienced what it's like to be thirsty out on a hot day and maybe working in the garden or out playing or doing whatever we like to do in the heat of the summer. But I don't think we've ever been as thirsty as he was. But at the same time, there is this thirst deep with inside each one of us that longs to be satisfied. A thirst so great that people will go to great lengths and try all kinds of things in order to quench it only to find that nothing really works. It's painful. It's agonizing. And people all around us are dying for a drink. When we come to chapter 4 of John's Gospel, we find Jesus sitting by Jacob's well. He's passing through Samaria with his disciples, and he's taking a rest from his journey. And no doubt as he's sitting there, he would probably like to have a drink of water. The passage tells us that his disciples have gone into town to buy food, and so he's there alone. But really, if you think about it, this is a very unusual place for Jesus to be. Yes, it makes sense that he's there resting by the well after his morning journey, but look at where he's at. This isn't Israel. This isn't Judea. This isn't Galilee. This is Samaria. And for most Jews, Samaria was a place that you just did not go. It's kind of like one of us going to the bad side of town or the inner city. Those places that we try to avoid 
You see, we've heard all the news reports, the violence, the drugs, the gangs, and all the other bad stuff that goes on in those parts of town. Of course, we know that kind of stuff really happens everywhere, and perhaps just as often, even in our own quiet little communities, crime and sin, it's everywhere. But we tend to overlook a lot of that because the media and TV and movies have all led us to believe that somehow crime and people in those kinds of places are to be avoided. It's so much worse in those bad areas than it is in other places. And so, of course, we avoid them, thinking, and perhaps sometimes rightly, that if we don't belong there, we don't go there, not even just to pass through. And, of course, the same was true for Samaria. Yes, the Jews, too, had their stories about how bad it was. It was unsafe, unclean, and the sinners there were worse than sinners in other places. After all, the Samaritans are heretics. That's how they viewed them. And even though the road through Samaria was easier and faster, most would rather take the long way around than step than set foot on Samaritan soil. And yet today, this is exactly where we find Jesus. Sitting by a well at high noon in the middle of Samaria. But as Jesus is resting there, along comes a woman. She's thirsty. She's got her water jug with her. And as we read this passage, we kind of get the sense that Jesus was somehow expecting her. It seems that he was waiting there for her to arrive. Now, a lot of really bad stuff has been said about this woman. Some have called her an adulteress. Others call her a prostitute or other, all kind, other kinds of things that are really bad. They make her out to be kind of the poster child for the worst of all sinners. But as we read this passage, is that really an accurate description of this woman? I mean, what do we really know about her? All the scripture says to us, as Jesus reveals there in verses 17 and 18, is that she has had five husbands, and that the man that she is now living with is not her husband. And that's it. That's all we know. But oh, how we like to let our imaginations run wild based on just a little information And down to the centuries when people have been speaking on this passage, they make her out to be one of the worst women imaginable. But we don't like gaps in the story, and so we like to fill in that information. Well, let me fill it in for you a little bit today. Perhaps this woman wasn't a prostitute or an adulteress. Perhaps she had been divorced five times or maybe widowed. Perhaps she'd been abandoned by previous husbands. And perhaps the man that she is now living with, she depends on just to survive. Is it a perfect situation? Absolutely not. But she must survive. Otherwise, she'd be left out in the cold, exposed to the elements. Maybe she was divorced abandoned, widowed, or a combination of all three, certainly would be tragic. But it's probably not impossible. The truth is, we don't know much about her. But regardless if she's a prostitute or has suffered a series of tragic events, she's obviously led this very difficult life making her the scorn of her community. She's either an awful sinner or extremely unlucky, but no one wants to be seen with her, and we know this because she's coming to the well in the middle of the day. You see, women would typically go to the well to draw water in the mornings or in the evenings when it was cool. And they would go together It was much more than just a daily chore for them. This was a time of fellowship, a time to get away and talk and gossip and enjoy each other's company. 
This was the gathering place that they went to a couple times a day. Just for a little bit of fellowship. And yes, of course, to get water. Kind of like the proverbial water cooler at work. Kind of the gathering place. But this woman we see here comes alone and at noon. And it indicates that she is clearly an outsider. Disregarded by the other women. And perhaps even ostracized by the rest of the town. And like most people on the margins of society, she's well aware of where she stands. People like this know where they can go and where they can't go. Who they can talk to and who they can't talk to. They know who accepts them and who doesn't. And many times, people on the margins feel unworthy. That they deserve their poor treatment, not just from others, but also from God. And perhaps they've given up accepting their situation as just their lot in life. But as she meets Jesus there at the well, something dramatic is about to change for her. And in verse 7, it's She meets Jesus. Jesus says to her, will you give me a drink? Now that doesn't sound like something all that remarkable. But she immediately recognizes that there's something not quite right about this situation. First of all, it was unusual for a man to speak to a woman in public. A lot of times in this culture, men wouldn't even speak to their wives in public. You spoke to a woman in private, and you certainly didn't speak to a woman you didn't know in public. But Jesus speaks to her, and she's not used to people probably speaking to her at all, even addressing her, asking her for anything, and yet Jesus asks her for a drink. But then she also points out, as we read in verse 9, she says, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? Jews do not associate with Samaritans, as the scripture passage tells us. Of course, that's probably the understatement of the century. No, of course they don't associate with the, with the Samaritans. There's no way a righteous Jew would ever speak to, much less drink from the same container as a Samaritan. Some would rather die of thirst, and they actually have writings They've gone back and found that people have said this. They would rather die of thirst or die of starvation before accepting anything from a Samaritan. That's how they viewed them. How can you ask me for a drink? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. But there is something they do have in common. Whether Jew or Samaritan or Gentile or whatever, all people everywhere have one thing in common, and that is the need for water. Everyone has thirst that longs to be satisfied. And so when Jesus sees the Samaritan woman, he sees someone who is absolutely dying of Listen again to verses 9 and 10. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, I am a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. If you would have asked him, he would have given you living water. But what is that? What is this living water that Jesus speaks of? The woman, of course, doesn't seem to understand it. First, she asked him in verse 11, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. You don't have a bucket, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? You see, most people at that time understood living water to mean water that is flowing, 
water that is coming out of a spring as opposed to water that is flat and stagnant and sitting in a well. Where is this living water? And of course she's thinking, oh, how much easier it would be to fetch water from a spring than from this deep well. And how much better that water would taste than the water that's been sitting in here for centuries. Sir, you have no bucket. Where do you get living water? She doesn't understand. She's still thinking about the well. And so Jesus attempts to explain what he's talking about. And we read in verse 13, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, he says, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And with that, I think she kind of get, gets it a little bit. I still don't think she fully understands, but she's starting to understand. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. I think she kind of gets it. This living water that Jesus Christ offers us, of course, is the gospel. It is the good news of God's salvation. It is the news for all of us of His grace, of His forgiveness. It is the gift of His Spirit and the freedom from sin that He promises us. It is of a full and rich life, free from our past and living for the glory of God. This is the living water. Yes, she says, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty. You know, there are thirsty people like this woman all around us. Men and women everywhere, absolutely dying thirst and they are looking for anything and everything to try and quench quench that thirst we know that some try to satisfy that with material things with wealth and with money and possessions others are looking for it in success and popularity and climbing the social ladder Some think the answer is to drink in as much lust and sensuality and pleasure as possible. And all too many are reaching, especially these days it seems, all too many are reaching for drugs and other mind-altering substances. I find it kind of interesting that in some places, water is a slang word used for some drugs. People are thirsty. And there's no end to the things that people will try or the lengths that they will go in order to satisfy this deep thirst that is within their souls. And these things of the world, as satisfying as they may seem at the moment, simply do not quench our deep inner thirst. They just simply leave you thirsting for more and more, and in the end, it's about the same as drinking a cup full of sand. But they continue to drink. Listen to the words of David in Psalm 63. David had fled into the wilderness, fleeing from his son Absalom, who was threatening to take over the throne. And David is out there in the wilderness alone, probably has his companions with him. But he says in Psalm 63, O God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. And so I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hand and call on your name. Jesus, uh, Jesus. David knew where to find living water. 
And today there is good good news for those who thirst and long for a drink of that living water. The good news is that Jesus is willing to meet us where we are at. This meeting at the well, I believe, was no accident. It wasn't just some random encounter. Now, it may have seemed that way to the woman who was coming probably at her usual time to draw water. It may have seemed like a random encounter, but with God, nothing is random. Jesus intended to meet her there. And the same is true for us. No matter where we are, in whatever place we find ourselves, Jesus is there waiting for us to come. And he offers us to come and drink just as we are. Notice in this passage, he didn't scold the woman or even point the finger like everyone else perhaps had. In fact, he didn't even start talking about her past until after he offers her living water. It's important to remember. The truth is, Jesus is not so much concerned with our past. We have, all of us, we have stuff back there in the past that we're not proud of. And for some, that may be as recently as last night or last week or maybe as long ago as 10 years ago. We all got stuff in our past. And yes, we need to repent and ask for forgiveness. But I think what Jesus is more concerned with is today. And he invites us to come just as we are right now and take a long, slow drink. I know that perhaps there are some here today who have thoughts that maybe they don't deserve good things from God. Maybe you feel unworthy to receive this living water. Perhaps there's something in your past or something you did or Maybe something that had happened to you and you don't feel worthy of God's grace and forgiveness. And maybe you even feel like an outcast, even as you sit here in church this morning. Thirsty and wishing all of that could change. You know, most of us, I think, if we're really honest with ourselves, have probably felt like this woman, at least at some point in our lives. We can identify with her because we know what it's like to be dying of thirst. But at the same time, we can testify right along with her that we have found water. Living water from God's eternal spring. We never have to thirst again. But if you've never experienced that, I'm here to tell you that there's hope. Jesus is waiting at the well for you, waiting for you to come. And I know it perhaps sounds a little cliche, but it's he's expecting you. Perhaps there are some here today who believe and have faith in Jesus Christ, and yet you still feel like you're dying of thirst. Perhaps you're struggling with some tough issues in your life overwhelmed by circumstances. Maybe you've made some bad choices and you feel like you're lost and wandering alone in the desert without a drop to drink. Jesus has water for you. And all we have to do is ask. He says to the women, if you need, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. That living water is, of course, so much more than simply going to heaven when we die. Yes, that is our hope, but the gift of God, the gift of living water is also for life here and now. And Jesus calls us to pour out that cup of sand and be filled with his living water. As I close here this morning, and as Mary Ann comes to play for us,
you are thirsty and the Lord has been speaking to you or there's something on your heart that's weighing on you and you need the refreshing spring from God, I invite you to come and pray as we sing our closing hymn.